Amiuri and both the Dutch and US economic models are those of mixed capitalist economies, where the means of production are largely in the hands of private parties and where governments play a key role by regulating markets, providing essential social services and redistributing wealth via taxes. Beyond that, these two systems couldn't be more different, with the American welfare state being one of the most bare bones in the western world, while despite years of budget cuts, the Dutch economic model still has a reputation for being far more generous with extending benefits and services than the American system. But in the end, there's only one thing that matters. Do these systems help or hinder the lives of ordinary citizens? To answer this question, let me introduce you to two ordinary middle class citizens, Joe and Jolien. Two university graduates working respectable white collar middle class jobs, both patriots who believe that it's not luck, not inherited wealth, no, it's hard work that will get you ahead in life in these economic systems. In other words, they both believe in the American dream. But which economic model will be able to support our hardworking protagonists better? To find out, we are going to do something that has never been done before. American YouTuber Econoboy For sure. and myself will judge the two systems in an epic detailed show off on the following eight dimensions. Wages and cost of living. She paid an effective tax rate of only 20.5%. So why is private healthcare insurance so much cheaper in the Netherlands? falling out of the middle class. Unfortunately, Joe's employer will have to let him go. Labor market conditions. You see, the Dutch model just wanted stability and benefits for Jolien. And that's how the Dutch ended up with such a fractured labor market quality of life. Well, one thing is for sure, and that is that some of the best hospitals in the world can be found in the United States, starting a family. To their surprise, they find out that it's quite expensive in the Netherlands, with it consuming 17% of the average wage. Education systems. However, let's be honest, Joe and Jolene's kid is extremely unlikely to end up in one. Moving up in the world. In the Netherlands, the middle class has been growing with 2% from 76% in 1991 to 78% in 2013. And finally, pension systems. Furthermore, for the average Joe, US Social Security though is not as generous as the Dutch state pension and provides roughly just under 40% of average earnings before retirement. But let's move on to the sponsor of this video, which is perhaps you. This video really took a long time to make and I could certainly use some help. Therefore, I'm now accepting donations in the form of individual donations or via the Patreon website and a link to both in the description of this video. So without further ado, let the competition begin. Round one fight. Working respectable middle class jobs, both Joe and Jeline are provided by their systems, the median wage. The median wage refers to the wage earned by the middle person in the income distribution. This metric is generally considered the most reliable indicator for a middle class income because the average wage is skewed too much by the ultra rich. For Joe, that median wage is roughly 51,000 US dollars. Using the latest dollar euro exchange rate, Jolene earns roughly 45,000 US dollars every year. To obtain these earnings, both work 40 hour full time weeks. However, as you know, the tax authorities want their cut. So let's look at wages minus income taxes next. In economics, this is known as disposable income. Here I came across something that genuinely surprised me about taxes. Because if we believe the headlines, the Netherlands is a high income tax country, while the US is not. For example, the lowest income tax bracket in the Netherlands is 37%, while that is the same as the highest tax bracket in the United States. But because both countries have tax deductions and exemptions, the taxes Joe and Julien will actually end up paying are going to be far lower than these headline numbers. If deductions are taken into account, Joe was due well over 11,000 US dollars a year in taxes. That's an effective tax rate of 20.93%. On the other hand, in big government Netherlands, Jolene paid only a little over 9,000 US dollars in taxes. 
This means that she paid an effective tap rate of only 20.5%. So middle class Jolene has a lower tax rate than middle class Joe. That being said, the American system is still ahead and leaves hardworking Joe with a disposable income of roughly 40,000 US dollars versus 36,000 in the Netherlands for Jolene. But to truly settle this discussion, we need to go one level deeper to what economists call discretionary income. Discretionary income is the income that you are truly able to spend freely after subtracting all of the expenses that are essential for your survival. Think food, shelter, transportation, clothing, healthcare, and paying off your student debts. So let's have a look at food first. Here, eating in America is a bit more expensive, with Joe spending almost 5,000 on food last year compared to Jolien's 3,700 in the Netherlands. Next up, let's compare housing expenses. Again, Joe here spends a bit more with $13,200 annual compared to Jolene who spent $13,000. Now this really surprised me since house prices are typically a bit higher in the Netherlands and so is rent. And while the Netherlands has quite a bit of social housing and rent subsidies, at least compared to the USA, middle class Jolene doesn't qualify for these. So what could explain this difference? Well, here there are two possible explanations. First, Jolene's mortgage rate was quite a bit lower. And second, more importantly, like her peers, she lived in an apartment that was much smaller than Joe since the housing stock in the Netherlands typically consists of much smaller houses and apartments. So you might actually be getting more house for your money in the US, but let's put a pin in that for now and discuss it in our quality of life section. And while the Netherlands seems to be winning in the cost department so far, the next category will change that. And that category is clothing, where in spite of her ridiculous habit of dressing up in traditional costumes, Julene has spent more than 1500 US dollars versus Joe's 1200 US dollars in the USA. Next up, transportation costs, where I thought the US economic model would definitely win because every time I hear about gas prices in the US, I'm like, wow, these are low. And sure, gas prices in the US are much lower than in the Netherlands, and Joe's Volkswagen Golf was also much less expensive at roughly $23,000 compared to the same car that would cost $30,000 in the Netherlands. However, thanks to dense cities with great public transport and cycling infrastructure, Jolene does not need to own a car and therefore rents it occasionally for trips to her parents in the countryside. For all other trips, she can comfortably use either the massive Dutch public transportation system, her bicycle or just walk. This explains why Jolene's annual transportation costs were roughly 3.4 thousand US dollars in the Netherlands versus Joe's 6,300 in the USA. There's actually a really cool video about how the design of infrastructure influences car behavior from the YouTube channel, Not Just Bikes, which I'll link to in the description. Okay, back to Joe and Jolene and their expensive lives. For the next category of healthcare spending, we need to have a look at the US and Dutch healthcare systems. You see, in both systems, most healthcare spending is supposed to go through the healthcare insurance system. These systems have a fundamentally different structure. In the US, there is public healthcare insurance for the poor and the elderly via Medicaid and Medicare respectively. And for the rest of the population, there are private health insurance providers. However, the cost difference between these two systems is so massive that there are also plenty of people who simply choose to forgo healthcare insurance altogether. And while middle class Joe doesn't qualify for cheap public insurance, luckily he can afford private healthcare insurance at roughly 3200 per year. On the other hand, in the Netherlands there is only private healthcare insurance. Yes, you heard that right, only private healthcare insurance in the Netherlands. And for her private healthcare insurance plan, Jolene pays roughly 1800 US dollars per year. So why is private healthcare insurance so much cheaper in the Netherlands? Well, the reason for this is that the Dutch healthcare system is heavily regulated with the goal of achieving low cost, full coverage and transparency for consumers. To increase transparency and promote competition between insurance companies, the Dutch government every year determines the contents of the basic health insurance package. Furthermore, to promote fair competition, insurance companies have to sell the basic health insurance package to whoever wants it. 
So for example, an insurance company cannot refuse elderly customers or charge them a higher rate because they are more risky. To keep the market fair, the state has set up a compensation fund for those insurers which have been unlucky enough to get the most elderly customers. As a consequence of this smart design, the Dutch healthcare insurance market is actually highly competitive and prices are therefore relatively low, although many Dutchies would argue that they're still way too high. Indeed, this is reflected by the fact that the USA, which has a younger population, spends roughly 16.8% of GDP on healthcare, whereas the Netherlands spends only 10%. Furthermore, every Dutch citizen has health insurance, while 8% of the American populace is not insured. So with the healthcare insurance system in the Netherlands clearly cheaper, there is still a one cost that we really need to discuss, the cost of paying off all your student debts. Because of their modest backgrounds, both Joe and Julien had to borrow quite a bit to pay for their university education. As a consequence, Joe ended up with a student debt of $33,000. And while the average college is of similar quality in the Netherlands, they are significantly cheaper. Therefore, Julien's average student debt in the Netherlands is $17,000 US dollars. Furthermore, in the Netherlands, she borrowed from the state at 0% interest, while US Joe borrowed from the federal government at the lowest possible rate of 2.75% interest. Now since both wanted to repay their student debt in 20 years, on average Joe ended up paying roughly $2,146 annually. Meanwhile Julien pays only $846 US dollars annually. And with that we've come to the end of this round. Even though Joe earns a higher wage and has more disposable income after taxes, Julien has quite a bit more discretionary income in the Netherlands at almost 12,000 US dollars per year compared to almost 10,000 in the USA. So who won? I'll discuss this with American YouTuber Econoboy before moving on to round two. Econoboy, who do you think won this category? Yeah, you know, I, I say that overall the point has to go to the Netherlands for me, even though they have a higher cost for some things like cars. And I think the overall price level is a bit higher in the Netherlands. At the same time, in the US, you'll make slightly more, but it's a lot more precarious of a wage because you spend a lot more on healthcare um, and education. You know, the number one thing that uplifts people out of poverty is education. And uh, the fact that it's so much more expensive in the United States versus the Netherlands means that you get paid higher wages, but overall, it's uh, you, 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 you know, you pay for those higher wages in the form uh, of the probably the most important things that you would need uh, on a day to day basis is over the long term. So for me, the Netherlands would be preferable. Yeah. All right. That makes total sense. I find it especially very interesting that in the Netherlands, actually middle class people don't pay as much taxes as people would expect and that they, they would have an effective tax rate. It's actually very close to the US. And then even though the US has higher disposable income, discretionary income is really what matters in practice, like you said. So I'm going with you as well. And I'm also going to award this one to the Netherlands. And then we'll see in our next round if the uh, Americans can make that up. Let's see. <coughs> Netherlands wins round two fight. Okay, so the American model is down, but far from out. Next, let's introduce a little bit of drama into the lives of our middle class heroes by assuming that both the United States and the Netherlands are hit by a global recession. Due to the uncertainty of the recession, unfortunately, Joe's employer will have to let him go. On the other side of the Atlantic, Joe leans temporary contract will also not be renewed for the same reason. Having both been raised with the typical middle class attitude of working hard to better their situation, both Joe and Juline immediately try to pick themselves up by accepting any job, even if it means looking for a minimum wage job at a large fast food chain and looking for better opportunities from there. As expected, Jolene's new job pays her considerably less at the minimum wage, which is $12 per hour, and which translates to an income of almost $25,000 per year. That's a bit more than half of what she earned previously. Luckily, the Dutch economic system will make her life considerably cheaper. Not only does her effective tax rate drop to 6.4%, she now is qualified for cheaper social housing, rent subsidies and health insurance subsidies. Let's compare this to Joe's situation in America. 
There, the minimum wage in the state of Georgia is equal to the federal minimum wage at $7.25 per hour. This translates to a much lower $15,000 US dollars annually in Joe's new job as a burger flipper. Sure, this is still above the federal poverty level of roughly $13,000 US dollars per year, but Joe now earns a lot less than Jolene. And sure, Joe's tax bill will also be greatly reduced, but in the lower class his effective tax rate is now much higher than that of Jolene at 11.8%. To offset all of this, the American economic model does now qualify him for the government-sponsored healthcare insurance plan called Medicaid. However, unlike in the Netherlands, social housing is scarce and that limited social housing that is there has a very bad name. If I would care about niggas getting high in the projects, Man, 5 will be down here about the bodies, yo. That's what they be down here about. On top of that, Joe has much less scope to cut his transport costs since public transport is much worse in the US. So it's safe to say that he is now considerably worse off than Jolene. But okay, you could argue, well, the recession will end. It sucks for Joe, but it's not the end of his middle class life, right? And even if the recession doesn't end anytime soon, he could just learn a new skill, right? Perhaps he should just learn how to code? Give me a break. Anybody who can throw coal into a furnace can learn how to program for God's sake. Well, sadly, Joe has just come across a problem that is not always sufficiently highlighted in the media and in the economics profession. And that is that falling down too far the economic ladder might make it impossible to climb back out for two very practical reasons. The first reason is that Joe won't have time to work anymore to learn how to code because he needs to work 60 hours per week just to feed himself and his family. He now belongs to a group known as the working poor and that group has become a much larger recently in the United States. The second reason is that Joe might not be able to get a job anymore because Joe can no longer afford to live close to job centers and cannot afford the transportation he needs to go to job interviews or to remote jobs. Let's be clear, these two factors also affect Jolene in the Netherlands, but they affect her far less. Because of her much higher discretionary income, Jolene can choose to work part-time in her minimum wage job and use the rest of her time to retrain. Alternatively, she may choose to work 40 hours a week so that she has more money left to pay for specific training. When it comes to the very real issue of transport, this is where Dutch social housing, which is also present in major very expensive cities like Amsterdam, as well as its extensive public transportation system and cycling infrastructure come in. In. To illustrate this, I had a colleague at the University of Cape Town in South Africa who had to travel using public transport every day, three hours to the university and then three hours back, while it took me half an hour by car and half an hour back. How was she ever supposed to move up in the world of academia if she was stuck in an overcrowded minibus all the time? Luckily for Joe, the US is not as bad as this yet. But one thing is for sure, Jolene is much more mobile than Joe and thus has more chances to pick herself up again. What's more, Jolene can more easily take a risk and perhaps start her own business in the Netherlands because the consequences of dropping out of the lower class are again much less severe in the Netherlands. The main reason for that is that even though Jolene was unfortunate enough to get fired, she then was first entitled to between 70 to 75 percent of her last earned wage for a period between three months to two years, depending on how long she has worked. What's more, even though she had to go through the trouble of proving that she really, really couldn't find a job for multiple years, she would eventually enter the basic social benefits program that pays her to the tune of roughly 70% of minimum wage. What's more, while in this program, the Dutch state first allows her to postpone her student debt payments and later completely forgave this debt. Well, this program was certainly no picnic, it did allow her to spend her time looking for new jobs and retrain. In comparison, not having had the time to retrain, if Joe eventually gets fired as Burger Flipper, where can he go? And since the US economic system only awards unemployment benefits for 5 months maximum and at the lower 66% of his previous minimum wage, he has just found himself below the poverty line. And when these unemployment benefits eventually ran out on Joe, he blamed nobody but himself. Ashamed that his family would find out about his failure, he had nothing left but the streets. 
And so that's where he ended up, under a bridge with dozens of others. No wonder that when it comes to social mobility the Netherlands ranks 6th and the US ranks 27th. Luckily for Joe, if the American economic system doesn't care about you, your family still might. And after a couple of months, when Joe looked up, he saw a familiar face. It was his father, who told him that he shouldn't feel guilty and that he can live back home with his parents for a while. All right, that was round two, uh, one that the Dutch went in feeling strong. But uh, let's take it to our first uh, juror, Economy. What who do you think won? I think in terms of the support for people who fall out of the middle class or find themselves without work it certainly has to go to the Dutch in general. The Dutch system is undeniably, no question about it, a lot more generous and supportive to those people that find themselves unable to work. You know, welfare doesn't appear by any measure or any metric that I've seen to discourage significantly people from working, assuming that it's measured in implementation. And the Dutch have a better system of that overall. So to me, the Dutch, I would say, are, are more supportive and uh, much more more amicable to people finding themselves without work or finding themselves lower income than they used to be. All right, thank you. Uh, I actually think that there is uh, again agreement between the Dutchman and the American on uh, on this one. I'm also going to give this point to the Dutch system. And I was especially shocked by the fact that if you uh, earn a minimum wage, that you actually pay a, a much higher tax rate in the US. And also as a Dutchman, I, I was definitely shocked by the total lack of, uh, of a safety net if you really fall through the cracks. So I think the, the Dutch definitely won this, uh, this category. Yep. All right, very good. Oh, Netherlands wins. Are you still feeling good about uh, the chances of uh, America in the next rounds? In the next round, labor market conditions, uh, it's hard to say. Oh, all right, let's, <laughs> let's have a look. Round three, fight. Okay, so things are starting to look a bit bleak for the American economic system. Let's be clear, while it was to be expected that falling out of the middle class was a bit rougher in the USA, the system can make it up by having a much better labor market. After all, if Joe wants to work hard and he can easily find a new job, then it doesn't really matter if unemployment benefits are worse. So let's now assume that an economic recovery has finally set in on both sides of the Atlantic. Julien is ready to transition back to a high paying job and with his faith in the American dream shaken, Joe is particularly eager to climb back up from his hardship. But with this level of benefits, surely people don't really want to work at all. Well, that's not obvious from the data. Despite the extensive social safety net, the number of people who can work and actually do the labor force participation rate in the Netherlands is actually higher at 83% versus 78% in the USA. Okay, another option might be that employers surely don't want to work in such a country with this huge benefit system and so it must be difficult to find a job for Jolene. Well, not if you look at the data. In fact, Jolene's chances are a bit better in the Netherlands which has an unemployment rate of only 3.5% as of 2021, while Joe in the US competes in a labor market with an unemployment rate of 6.1%. That being said, both countries seem to be doing quite a bit better than the average European Union unemployment rate of 8.1%. And much better than, for example, Spain with a massive unemployment rate of 15.3%. Therefore, eventually both Joe and Julien will find a new job and reclaim their old level of income. However, then the question becomes, will they be able to find a high quality job? Meaning that it is stable and has good benefits. In my research for this video, I discovered that both in the Dutch and American systems, there are multiple types of work arrangements of which some are clearly more desirable than others. For example, in the Dutch labor market, there are contracts for fixed term employees, permanent employees, temporary staff employed via an agency and finally independent contractors. And here you will see what some might call the beauty and others might call the wickedness of economics at work. You see, the Dutch model just wanted stability and benefits for Jolene, but at the same time it wanted to give employers some flexibility to fire Jolene if she was a bad employee or if the business environment really requires it. But these two, stability and flexibility, are obviously opposites. And that's how the Dutch ended up with such a fractured labor market with some contracts really being better than others. 
for example, take the first two contracts. They differ in flexibility. Confusingly, the fixed term contract is the most flexible because, as the name suggests, it is applicable for a fixed term of, for example, six months. Then there is the permanent contract, which is permanent. Unless there is a really good reason to fire Jolene, like her breaking the law or her misbehaving. But in that case, the employer needs to be able to prove this with a whole bunch of paperwork. And so, and this is the economics bit, employers had a really strong incentive to try to get around this pesky permanent contract by maybe giving employers one fixed term contract and then another fixed term contract and then another fixed term contract and go on and on indefinitely. But that's not where it stopped. At some point, Dutch employers also convinced the other participants in the economic model, unions and the government, to allow temporary staff via an agency and independent contractor arrangements, which would not only allow them to be more flexible, but also allow them to give these types of workers less benefits. But much to Jolene's delight, it seems that employers might have overplayed their hands a little with this increased flexibility as a new deal between unions and employers seems to be inevitable. That being said, what does the current state of the Dutch labor market mean for Jolene? Obviously, Jolene wants that sweet, sweet permanent contract. Not only will this give her peace of mind, this will also give her tangible benefits like helping her get a higher mortgage or stand up to her boss every once in a while. Luckily for her, given that 61% of people who work do have a permanent contract, Jolene still has quite a good shot at getting that sought after permanent contract to ensure her middle class lifestyle for the foreseeable future. And to be honest, even for Jolene, some flexibility might not be bad because it allows employers to better separate her from bad employees. All right, now let's look at Joe's position in the United States labor market and compare it to that of Jolene. First of all, Joe has to deal with less complexity since there isn't a big distinction between permanent and fixed term contracts in the States, since employers might pretty much just fire Joe on spot and don't have to justify that choice in most cases. You're fired, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired. However, even for employees, there is some duality, and that is whether or not they work full time. The reason for this is that if Joe works full time for his employer, he often does qualify for health insurance and other benefits. While if he works part time, he doesn't qualify. You can imagine how this system might be abused. But to be fair, just over 33% of American workers don't qualify for these benefits. And of these 51 million unlucky bastards, most are actually full-time workers. Furthermore, in the US, there is also a difference between contractors and employees. However, this difference is much more important for Joe, since unlike the Dutch system, the US economic system does not provide good health insurance and other benefits to the middle class and has delegated this responsibility to employers instead. Therefore, a no benefits contractor life would be much harder for Joe than for Jolene. However, on the bright side, it does appear that the chance of Joe becoming a contractor is slightly less than for Jolene, since according to some of the latest data, contractors only make up about 6.9% of the US labor force. All right, so this was the third round, labor market conditions. As is now almost a tradition, uh, I'm going to start with opinion of Econoboy. What did you think of uh, this round? Who won? I would say that the labor structure of the Netherlands is more stable overall. You probably have more job security at the point of getting a job in the Netherlands. And based on unemployment rates, it doesn't appear that there's a significant difference in your actual ability to obtain employment. And so if you're looking at the risk of not being able to get a job versus your stability once you have a job, to me, it seems like the Dutch have a better system in that regard. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I agree. I'm going to go with you as well with this point. But for me, it was fairly close in the sense that I don't like that the Dutch labor market is so fractured. Um, this fixed and permanent contracts, they seem very complicated. And, and so I think the Dutch labor market is more complicated than the US one. But the fact that benefits are so difficult to get as a, as a US employee, really does mean that I have to give the point to the Netherlands as well. 
For sure. I think that European systems, I did a video on immigration, which which found something similar, especially with the Nordic economies, is that when there's when there's huge disparities in how you regulate types of work between contract, full time, fixed, temporary, you know, all the visa workers, there can be huge equity problems. So it is important to sort of shrink the uh, variance in how you uh, regulate jobs. But overall, it seems that the Netherlands doesn't do too bad a job of this. Uh, and like you said, your 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 ease of access to benefits, uh, and not to mention the fact that uh, a lot of your benefits aren't necessarily tied to your employment. Like in uh, the US, most people who have insurance get it from their employer, which makes the, uh, I would argue, makes the labor market a lot more rigid than it would be otherwise. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that one. That is something that seems smarter for the government to provide or at least um, have a system for in place. They don't have to provide it themselves, as we will see in, uh, in future sections. But not to have the employer provide it, because then if you lose your job, you just lose everything, right? And that, that seems overly harsh. <coughs> Netherlands wins. Okay, so that uh, leaves three points uh, already for the Netherlands. Let's see if the, the UX can still catch up. It's still possible. Four uh, to three. Round four. Fight. So yet another blow to the once admired US system. But so far we've only looked at money, money, money. What about what that money gets you? Quality of life. Let's have a look at how comfortable Joe and Jolene's lives really are. Both Joe and Jolene are now working hard, earning that sweet, sweet money and spending what they need to live comfortably. Or do they? How comfortable are their lives really? For this part, I'm going to compare the economic models based on the following non-economic categories. Work-life balance, health, housing, the environment and safety. The free time needed for a healthy work-life balance can be divided into two categories. How much time Jolene and Joe have to relax during work weeks and how much time they have to go on vacation. When it comes to work-life balance, if he wants to, Joe can work on average 34.4 hours per week. On the other hand, Jolene is much more likely to find a great work-life balance and only work 29 hours per week. But that's not everything. What about vacation? Well, in the United States, while Joe's employer is not required by law to grant him any days off every year, he is graciously awarded 10 days off every year. Just enough for that vacation to the Netherlands, where he is likely to bump into Jolene strolling around town because her employers, while required to give her 20 days off, graciously gave her 25 days off. All right, next up, healthcare quality. We have already established that healthcare is much more expensive in the United States. But is it much better? Well, one thing is for sure, and that is that some of the best hospitals in the world can be found in the United States. However, the chance of Joe getting treated in one of these is very slim. So let's look at the average quality of healthcare instead. On the healthcare quality index, the Netherlands ranks 11th and the United States ranks 30th. Also, while there are 3.2 hospital beds on average per 100,000 citizens in the Netherlands, there are only 2.9 hospital beds in the United States. Finally, life expectancy in the Netherlands is a bit higher at 82 years, whereas in the United States, it is only 79 years. So Joe pays more and on average gets less. What's more, say that Joe or Jolene gets sick without needing to go to the hospital. Obviously, this will have economic consequences since then they might not be able to show up for work. Not a problem in the Netherlands where you can get up to two years of paid sick days. Obviously though, Jolene will need to prove that with a doctor's note. But while on sick leave, an employer is not allowed to fire Jolene. On the other side of the Atlantic, Joe is again at a disadvantage. While the Family and Medical Leave Act specifies that he can take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave for, for example, a serious health condition, there have been quite a few reports of people being fearful to call in sick to work. Not surprising, since an employer can fire him at will in the US. A new study shows 90% of people have come to work when feeling a bit under the weather. And for most people, it's because they're afraid to call out sick or don't have paid time off. So let's just avoid getting in the hospital then, shall we? Well, one thing that might surprise you is that in car-centric United States, the air quality is actually 
better than in the Netherlands, where Jolene breathes in 14 micrograms of malicious particles per cubic meter, whereas Joe only breathes in 10.1. Now you might say here, well, but America is this massive nation. What about if you look at the metropolitan areas that are perhaps more comparable to the Netherlands? Well, even then this trend holds surprisingly. And the reason for this is probably that diesel cars are much more popular in Europe. On the other hand, Jolene is more likely to be satisfied by the quality of her drinking water along with 93% of her fellow citizens compared to 83% of Americans. Water's brown, um, has a bad odor. I'm afraid to even um, feed it to my cat or my dog. That being said, both Joe and Jolene's house is almost guaranteed to contain all amenities such as running water and electricity. What's more, while Joe pays a little bit more for his housing expenses, he has a substantially bigger house, which has on average 2.4 rooms per person. On the other hand, Jolene lives smaller in her 1.9 room bedroom. So she will likely leave the house more often. Luckily, if she does so during the night, she is more likely to feel safe along with 82% of her fellow citizens. On the other side of the pond, Joe, along with 26% of his fellow citizens, feel considerably less safe. And understandably so, despite all of their guns, the homicide rate in the United States is considerably higher at 3.7% per 100,000 people compared to 06 in the Netherlands. But what does this all mean for happiness? Well, Jolene gives her life a 7.4, while Joe is still relatively happy and gives his quality of life a 6.9. But of course, you all care much more about what Econa Boy and myself have to say about that, right? Right, this is round four, quality of life. I think uh, this was definitely a uh, an exciting one. Econa Boy, what did you think? Who won? I think on this one, as frustrating as, is, as it is to say, I would say that this was a total wash. I can't really give a point to one system or another because honestly, your preferences make a lot of sense either way. So it seems like in the Netherlands, you might prefer a more urban, more densely packed uh, scenario. Uh, but if you're in the U.S., you might have a bit more options, a bit more uh, rural, more spacious lifestyle. And so I, th I would say overall, uh, I I'm not sure that one of those systems is strictly better for people over another. And so for me on median, it, you know, just kind of pick your preference, right? Do you want a bigger yard um, in a more rural spacious area? Or do you want uh, perhaps a more urban lifestyle where you're, you're kind of living in a shoebox? I mean, there's a lot of people that would prefer either one because of the amenities associated with living in a more urban areas. All right, very, very good. So I uh, will go with you again on, uh, on this one. Uh, even though I will note that my preference uh, is is still here in the Netherlands, although I would love to visit uh, America one, to, one time in my many vacation days. That's fair, that's fair. Round five. Fight. Okay, the US is back on its feet somewhat with this draw. Let's now give this comparison a bit of a twist. What do you think of the following scenario? Let's assume that using some of those generous, generous vacation days, Jolene decides to go on a long vacation to America to meet Joe. Naturally, with their shared love for hard work, family and patriotism, they fall in love and eventually they decide to start a family. However, the problem is now that they have to decide where to raise that family, the USA or the Netherlands. Sure, they could base that decision on whose relatives are more likable, but this is an economics channel, so they only use economic arguments. After all, the last weeks of pregnancy, childbirth and the first few weeks cannot really be done in the office. For that reason, in the United States, employers are required by law to offer the mother 12 weeks of leave to have and take care of that baby. Sounds pretty great, right? Uh, no, this is unpaid leave and an estimated 41% of workers are not even covered by the law in question. Also for daddy, nothing. 
just work. A bit turned off by this, Joe and Jeline might now turn their gaze towards the Netherlands where every mother will get 6 weeks of leave before and 10 weeks after giving birth. During this time, Jeline will receive 100% pay from her employer, which will in turn be compensated by the government. Furthermore, father Joe can get up to one week fully paid leave after the baby is born and optionally five more with 70% pay. Okay, baby out, a good night of sleep and back to work. Let's be honest, having a young child will impact the career of both Jolene and Joe well after these first few weeks. So what are the possibilities for working less in the United States and in the Netherlands? First, it is very much possible and quite acceptable to employers if Jolene as a young mother desires to work on a part-time basis. It is also, but to a lesser extent, possible for Joe to do this as a father in the Netherlands, where it is now becoming more common to have a daddy day every week. At the same time, in the United States, part-time work is starting to become more accepted as well, but it's far from being as common for young parents as it is in the Netherlands. So for now, it seems logical that Joe and Jeline move to the Netherlands. However, at that point, Joe might ask, well, couldn't we just send our children to daycare? So they examine how expensive childcare is and to their surprise, they find out that it's quite expensive in the Netherlands, with it consuming 17% of the average wage. However, in the United States, it's even more expensive at 23% of the average wage. Still, let's be honest, in both countries having kids will be a detriment for either Jolene's or Joe's career. And in both countries it's more likely to hit that of Jolene. In the USA, 20% of parents stop working while in the Netherlands the number is close to that at 15%. So while Joe admits the extra flexibility that the Dutch economic system provides would be nice, he proposes that they rely on the verdict of the jury on where to move to. Okay, so here we are, round five. Econoboy, who do you think won? You know, this is one that uh, confuses me, honestly. I think uh, because in America, there's definitely a conservative movement to uh, eschew away immigration and prefer a family structure at home, but we don't actually do a lot to support family structure uh, amongst the domestic population. You know, it seems like a weird contradictory stance uh, amongst our our population and or at least a, a good portion of our population you know assuming that you can get a decent job in either place the netherlands or the united states um the netherlands offers a lot more flexibility to parents uh, so as i would put it if you're okay with your child having a funny accent uh, you should probably shoot your resume over to uh, some dutch companies right they invented the stock market so i'm sure that they've got some some pretty decent jobs uh, over there, especially if you're looking uh, to start a family in the most stable situation possible. Yeah, I totally agree on you. And I do have to say that uh, we have improved here on Netherlands a little bit because we used to be lagging behind a lot when it comes to free time for the father. We recently bumped it up. Uh, so it, so we are working on it. It is still a work in progress, uh, I have to say. But I, I'm also going to go uh, with a point for the Netherlands here. All right. <coughs> Netherlands wins round six. Fight. Unsatisfied with the jury's answer, Joe might now suggest that they postpone their decision till after they have considered the future of their child, and specifically both countries' primary and high school systems. Luckily in both countries, education is seen as a basic right, and therefore government-provided public schools are mostly free. So you'd think these are a no-brainer. And they are, in the Netherlands. But if Joe and Jolene want to live in the US, they need to seriously consider sending their kid to a private school instead. Why? Well, because the quality of public schools in the US can vary a lot depending on where you live. To understand why that is, let's have a look at the economics and specifically the funding model of education in the United States and the Netherlands. In the United States, public schools are funded through a local property taxes. On the other hand, in the Netherlands, public schools are funded by the national government. This difference is very important because in the USA, a local funding means that schools in wealthy neighborhoods can have much more money than those in poorer neighborhoods. Therefore, it makes sense that if Joe and Julien cannot afford a house in a wealthy neighborhood, they opt for a private school instead. And these can be much more expensive at roughly 15,000 US dollars per year. On the other hand, in the Netherlands, thanks to central funding, all teachers, no matter where they live, 
earn the same. Therefore, the Dutch economic system has the opposite problem, namely that in wealthy cities there are often not enough teachers because it's more difficult to live there on a teacher's salary. So this means that typically poorer rural areas might actually have access to better quality schools. Although to be honest, the difference is not big enough yet to avoid the big wealthy cities altogether. Given their middle class status, the fact that public schooling is consistently better and cheaper in the Netherlands gives Julien one more argument in favor of moving to her homeland. However, in a last dish attempt by Joe, he suggests that of course higher education should also be considered in this crucial decision. Here again we bump into some significant differences between the two models. In the Netherlands most higher education institutions are owned by the government and are therefore heavily subsidized. What they end up costing you depends on the type of institution, with the vocational education institutes costing up to 1500 US dollars per year, while applied and research universities will set you back roughly 2700 dollars per year, without accounting for the cost of books. That's a lot of money, and not all parents are able to afford that for their children. But let's contrast this with the USA, where the cost of higher education can set you back a whopping 16,000 US dollars at public universities. However, as with high schools, public institutions are often considered inferior. So what will it cost if Joe and Jeline want that extra push for their child? Well, private for profit institutions will on average cost 23,000 US dollars per year, and if they want their kid to go to a prestigious private non profit institution like Harvard, MIT, or. So, Mr. Smith, you want to go to Princeton? Well, actually, I want to go to SeaWorld, but is Princeton along the way? <laughs> We frown on that at Princeton. <laughs> this will set them back over $50,000 per year. Sure, the most prestigious universities in the world are almost all in the United States. However, let's be honest, Joe and Jolene's kid is extremely unlikely to end up in one. No, it's much more likely for their kid to get a spot at great universities like California State or City University of New York, which are typically ranked lower than most Dutch public universities that accept all Dutch kids with good enough grades. On top of that, while Dutch institutions vary in international rankings, this variance is so low that students often base their preferred university choice on which city has the best nightlife. And with those pictures of how amazing student life can be if you're not in the middle of a pandemic, let's move on to discuss which education system is the winner. Donna boy, who do you think uh, won this one? What's the best system? In terms of raising a child, both educations offer uh, ultimately uh, quality uh, learning to their students. And so, you know, given that quality can kind of be set aside, let's look at equitable access, let's look at afford affordability. And overall, the Netherlands, uh, frankly, just dominates the US in that regard. There's much more equitable, equitably funded, um, and better overall access to the quality education. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you, but there's one thing that uh, I will say for the US to, to save the honor of, uh, of your beautiful system a little bit. Uh, when it comes to top-notch schools, uh, especially in higher education, I can say as an academic, the elite um, US universities are still uh, the kings of, uh, of the academic world, the, the Harvards, the Stanford's, the MIT. But since we are talking about uh, the, the ordinary people's life, the middle class, life, then I don't think this really matters because you won't be able to send your kids there anyway. And then you do actually have, I think, a much better chance of giving your kid a really good and very cheap education here in the Netherlands. Yeah, exactly. I mean, on median, you know, a median person, median children, uh, in terms of ability, performance, everything, um, Harvard and Yale are not going to be accessible to them either because of the stringent qualification process or because uh, probably mostly because of how expensive it is. And, and when it comes to public and um, private high schools and, um, and primary schools, I would say, and you're looking for that uh, more equitable access. You know, for instance, a lot of people in America have to uh, move. They have to move cities, or they have to move uh, within that city just to send their kid to a school with a higher property tax uh, valuation. Um, it's it's a it's, it's a very unequal uh, system in the United States in terms of education. Yeah, exactly. And I could just, uh, my parents just picked the school that was closest by. 
So I could just walk to primary school and then later in high school I could just cycle there. It was just the one around the corner and that was good enough because they're all fairly fairly good yeah yeah and the thing is if you do that in america you know most people do that they just pick the school that's closest by but unfortunately if you live in a low-income area uh, and you're not willing to move or you know if you're not able to move in a lot of cases um you end up sending your kids to a much much worse school so two points for the netherlands uh, again so this is getting a bit repetitive so let's see if the u.s can make a strong comeback in the next round We'll see. Maybe they can get six or seven points. Like they beat the Netherlands so hard in the next category that they get bonus points. Yeah, I do have high hopes for the moving up in the in the world category. I I, I still think that uh, the U.S. has some good cards there, but let's see. <laughs> Netherlands wins. So there it is. The discussion has been settled with the Dutch economic model providing more flexibility for young parents, a cheaper quality public primary and high school system as well as much more equitable and a cheaper higher education system of very good quality. Joe and Jolene decide to move to the Netherlands, where they will raise their newborn daughter, Joelle. Round 7. Fight! At this point you might think that the American model is down and out, but it really is not. After all, one part of the American dream has always been to make it big. Not just to be respectable in the middle class, but to break out of it and perhaps to even be a superstar, a high flyer, a baller if you will. I mean, you know, jewelry is just something that's like part of you as an artist, you know what I mean? Like I'm into jewelry, cars, fashion, you know what I'm saying, women. Poppin' GQ is Tiger. So let's see how the two systems stack up when it comes to breaking out of the middle class into the upper class and perhaps even into the global elite. To make this comparison, let's look at how many people moved out of the middle class and into the upper class in both countries. Sadly, the data isn't perfect here, but in the Netherlands, the middle class has been growing with 2% from 76% in 1991 to 78% in 2013. At the same time, the upper class grew by 3% and the lower class shrunk by 5%. Contrast this to America, where from 1971 to 2013, the share of people in the middle class decreased from 61% to 51% while the upper class grew by 6% and the lower class by 4%. Indeed, it is well known that income inequality in the United States has been rising and is substantially higher than in the Netherlands, where income inequality has actually been falling. While you might argue that this is bad for the middle class, you could also point to a larger upward mobility in the United States as 6% of people broke out of the middle class and into the upper class. But there's more to the story. It's not just that there seems to be more extreme upward and downward mobility in the States. The spoils of moving up are also much larger. To illustrate this, the top 10% of US earners take home a whopping 30% of all income compared to 23% in the Netherlands. To see what this means for the middle class, let's go back to Joe and Jolene. Let's say that they built a successful company and that they are now earning a very comfortable $200,000 income annually. In the Netherlands, their effective tax rate would be 44%. However, had they moved back to Atlanta, their tax rate would only have been 31.7%. And to make matters even worse, had they moved to Miami Beach, Florida, they would only need to pay 26.24% in income taxes. Another factor is that if you want to make it big as an entrepreneur, you also need a big market. And sure, while Dutch entrepreneurs have access to the massive European market in theory, in practice barriers such as different languages and regulations mean that American high flyers can expand much quicker. Indeed, the results of these factors can clearly be seen if we look at the embodiment of the American dream on steroids. The wealthiest entrepreneurs under 40 in both countries. Two key facts stand out. First, while most Dutch entrepreneurs have a public education, most American entrepreneurs have been educated at elite private universities and were therefore more likely upper class to begin with. Second, the wealthiest Dutchmen would be small time players in the US. Only the wealthiest Dutchman under 40, entrepreneur Paul de Jong, would make it into the American top 40 and there he would only make it to the 35th place. The others wouldn't even be close. 
This means that in America, not only are you more likely to move up or down significantly, if you make it big, you can really make it big. So for Joe and Jolene, it would actually make the most sense to move back to the States just after tasting success in the Netherlands. That way they could have it both ways. But does that really square with their middle class sense of honor? Before we find out, let's judge which system did better with Econoboy. All right, so moving up in the world, round seven. I think this was a, a very exciting one. Econoboy, who do you think won this one? So in terms of moving up in the world, you know, if you don't mind, uh, or if you don't imagine you'll ever be a millionaire or an entrepreneur in general, it makes sense to just go with the Netherlands. Uh, that said, even in the case where you're striving to be an entrepreneur, the more generous social assistance and welfare programs make entrepreneurship a lot less risky. So is the one in a million probability of becoming a hundred millionaire or billionaire worth, you know, the much more likely chance of an unsubstantial and inadequate support system in the United States? Well, I would say no, personally. You know, you face a lot more taxes when you become a billionaire, uh, but ultimately I think the road to wealth is a lot less rocky uh, in the Netherlands uh, than in America. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but I am going to defect a little bit from your from your guidance here. Uh, you previously, go. I think we've agreed on, on everything. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, and I'm going to go with the US, although I'm, I think it, it's a very close one, but the American dream and the, the sort of acceleration that you might be able to get uh, from paying those lower taxes if you break into the upper class and that, that you can then move, move on uh, just provides this super strong um, uh, dream. Yeah, basically that's what it is, like the American dream, uh, hope kind of sentiment which fits, I think, to the idealized image that I still have of uh, America as a foreigner. So I'm going to defect and, and go with uh, America on this one. I forgive you. Round Ach. fight. So with the Dutchman voting for the US and the American voting for the Dutch system, we can say that the American dream is at least somewhat still alive in the US when it comes to the international perception of being able to make it big in the United States. While the Dutch system seems to be better at making sure that everybody has the chance to make it fairly big. And so the Joe family might in their weakest moment consider moving to the States after making it big in the Netherlands. But of course they would never because they understand that the system giveth commerce, social safety, labor market protection, services, childcare and education. So paying higher taxes seems only fair to the now wealthy family and is viewed by them as a way of giving back to the system that treated them so well. Luckily the system has one more gift for them as they reach old age, a pension. So once again it's time for a big decision, where to retire. To be honest and purely based on movies and video games, I just have this idealized vision of retiring one day in sunny Miami. This is Paris, I'm telling you. But okay, this is an economics channel that takes itself somewhat seriously, so let's ask ourselves how much pension money did Joe and Jolene end up accruing? Well, most of that accruing was done by Jolene in the Netherlands where the pension system works as follows. The government provides a basic pension for everyone. The height of this pension is simply based on how many years you have lived in the Netherlands. Therefore, Jolene will receive the full state pension of roughly $1,500 per month or just around 70% of average earnings before retirement. Joe will also receive some state pension from the Dutch system, but only for the years that he lived there. In comparison, the United States has social security, which acts as a state pension. The difference with the Dutch pension though, is that how much you get depends on what you earned in your life, rather than the years that you lived in the country. So the US state pension is higher for the rich than for the poor and can be zero if you fail to get employment during your working life. Furthermore, for the average Joe, US social security though is not as generous as the Dutch state pension and provides roughly just under 40% of average earnings before retirement. But let's move on. While Joe did not build up any pension benefits during his time as a burger flipper, he did build up some private benefits while working his middle class job in the States in the form of a 401k plan. The 401k plan has taken the United States by storm and it works like this. 
an employee can, without paying income taxes on it, put a certain part of their income in a 401k savings account every month. This savings account is invested in financial markets. The height of his current monthly benefit therefore depends on how well financial markets have done over the last years. Because the monthly contributions of these plans are known while the benefits are uncertain, this type of plan is also known as a defined contributions plan. Contrast this to Jolien's pension, which is like most Dutch schemes, a defined benefits plan. Which, you guessed it, means that her monthly benefits, so which she will receive every month once she has retired, are defined rather than her contribution when she works. This means that if financial markets do poorly in the Netherlands, a big political storm will rage, because this might mean that the pension contributions of all current workers might need to be increased. Another difference with Joe's 401k is that Jolene's employer has also contributed to the scheme. Although that could be why her wage was on average a bit lower. Also, unlike Joe, Jolene did in fact contribute a bit to her pension plan during her time working her minimum wage job. Finally, I found out that while the US spends more on pensions than the Netherlands, elderly poverty is still much lower in the Netherlands at 3.1% compared to 23.1% in the States. So which has the better pensions? This is the last category that I will discuss with Econoboy and it is the one that will decide whether Joe and Jolene will sail away into the sunset on the Frisian lakes or from Miami Beach. Right, so this was the last round uh, and it's all about the last phase of life, retiring. Uh, so let's see which system uh, won this final knockout round. Who do you think won Econoboy? I would say that the US has a comparatively flexible and complex retirement system, but this doesn't seem to be a positive. The poverty statistics are a huge sticking point for me. Of course, the goal of any pension system is to ensure the security of the elderly as they become increasingly unable to work due to old age, and honestly the Dutch system just does a better job of this in that regard. The US spends more as a percentage of GDP on its retirement, but it doesn't see that return in the form of poverty reduction in elderly life, at least relative to the Dutch system. Kind of way, I'm going to uh, agree with you once again uh, on this one. I'll award the point for the Netherlands. And for me, the primary reason is that the social security payment or the state pension uh, in the two countries is different in a crucial way for me. And that is that in the Netherlands, you get rewarded a state pension based on the number of years that you lived in the country. Whereas in the US, it's tied to the number of years that you worked or either your spouse worked. And I think the Dutch system is fairer for those that have been unemployed at some point in their lives so that they don't get uh, double punished because for their private pension, you already take a hit on that one. And uh, this might explain partially why we have these lower poverty numbers for, for the elderly in the Netherlands. <coughs> Netherlands wins. So that was the story of Joe and Jolene and with that the full comparison of these two massive economic systems is finally done. Next up I'll discuss who won the overall competition with Econoboy. Okay and so that was the full competition, the American economic model versus the Dutch economic model. Econoboy, who do you think is the overall winner? I would say that it's certainly the Dutch economy and the Dutch system Overall, in my uh, long form discussion uh, with Yuri over on my channel, we kind of come to the conclusion, or I mentioned that in uh, the Nordic model series that I made, that people in the US are not as free as countries, ironically, with uh, more government expenditure, because in those countries with more expansive welfare programs and, and more uh, expansive supportive services in general, individual freedom uh, is, 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 is more bolstered, right? You have more freedom to access equitably the economy in a way that doesn't necessarily sacrifice growth. Uh, the US system, as Yuri described, is kind of risk adjusted. You know, you can earn marginally more, and if you do become wealthy, you have a, a lot more advantage than wealthy people in the Netherlands. But uh, the reality is you always have a constant backdrop of poverty and destitution that can eclipse the ambitions of a lot of people. Uh, and so, you know, assuming you're lucky enough on median to be born into a system with at least a decent school and access to educational resources, uh, you might make it out. But unfortunately, far too many children in America uh, simply aren't lucky enough uh, to be born into those circumstances. So overall, definitely would uh, prefer the Netherlands system to the American system. Yeah, uh, me as well, Econoboy. 
And what I th thought was really interesting about this uh, comparison is uh, really how big the difference is, both in the social safety nets, in all sorts of social safety nets, the services that the government gives, and the fact that as a middle class household, you do really don't pay that much more in taxes, uh, or actually you pay less in taxes. It's only when you get richer, if you start moving into the upper middle class, the and the upper class and the and the super rich, of course, uh, that you start paying a little bit more in taxes in the Netherlands. And I think that's really a key takeaway that's uh, very often missed in political debates. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I think so. I think a lot of people in the United States have a have a stronger version to uh, government programs, except for Medicaid and Social Security uh, and Medicare, I should say. Um, but, you know, overall, the idea that the government would implement regulation or implement some sort of a tax and system to fund a, a robust program. There's there's a lot of aversion to that, uh, ironically. But as uh, it seems, even with Americans, you know, we love our Medicare, right, which is a government insurance program. Uh, the most staunch rural conservatives uh, would absolutely uh, laugh at the idea of, of, a, of a representative actually cutting their Medicare. So, uh, you know, these programs end up being very successful. They end up being very popular. Uh, and they end up with uh, oftentimes better outcomes, you know, not that the Dutch system's perfect. I'm sure you can find better models than the Dutch system and not that even, you know, the, the, the most held up social democratic models of the Nordic economies are perfect either. Um, but there's a lot to learn from those systems from an American viewpoint. Yeah. And the one thing that I did find very striking is that when it comes to healthcare, which I know is a very hot button issue in the US, is that we here in the Netherlands have a fully privatized healthcare system that works really well, but only because it's heavily regulated. Yeah, exactly. Uh, unfortunately, the U.S. Uh, seems to be kind of a Frankensteinian type healthcare system with many competing uh, ideologies. And ultimately, if you just pick one and you recognize you need a lot of regulation, then we could actually have a, a much better uh, a healthcare yeah. system overall. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and the other point uh, where you have a bit of a social safety net, I think what's very often missed in the discussion is that like we have a social safety net in the Netherlands, but it's not fun. You really don't want to end up in there. You, you, do, you really want to work again, uh, but it's a, a little bit less bare bones, right? Like it's not about uh, going to a, a complete uh, utopian uh, welfare state. It's, it's to me just about outcomes, right? Uh, if I can pay more in taxes and have a more generous uh, social uh, welfare system, and it ends up that more people are out of poverty and more people have access to climbing the ladder of wealth, uh, then I feel like that's a perfectly reasonable trade-off. Um, but hey, as you pointed out, uh, it turns out that uh, when it comes to lower and middle income people, they don't actually end up paying significantly more in taxes. Only for the rich. Well, yeah, exactly. It seems like the but it but it seems like the wealthy bear this burden fairly effectively, uh, in that they can still maintain a lot of their wealth. They can still be, uh, you know, very very wealthy. Uh, but uh, it turns out, you know, Johnny that grows up in a lower income neighborhood has access to a, a decent education and a decent healthcare system, which seems to be better for everyone. You know, the wealthy person doesn't yeah. live in a more crime ridden uh, neighborhood because everyone has a good education and good access to social services. That's good for the wealthy person too. All right, thank you very much uh, Econoboy for this discussion with me. And I wanna recommend any, everyone to check out your channel, which is full of these types of uh, in-depth discussions on everything economics. For sure, yeah. Hopefully uh, the Biden administration can work with the Netherlands to purchase the Netherlands and just make the Netherlands one of the, one of the 51st states so that we might have access to the same systems. Oof. Yeah, maybe we can purchase you and make you one of our, 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 our provinces instead. <laughs> All right, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jerry. So this was finally it. The in-depth comparison of what a good middle-class life looks like in both the American and the Dutch system. Who won? Well, the scores are clear. The American dream is alive and kicking in the Netherlands. The superior economic system in almost every way. And it doesn't seem to lead to worse economic outcomes or people not willing to work, which I think is very important to highlight. But yeah, that's my take. What do you think? Did I make a fair comparison between the two models? And which country would you choose to try to live out the American dream? Let me know in the comments.